You're listening to episode 153 with Josh Sanchez. Welcome to the Gemba Academy podcast, the show that's focused on helping individuals and companies achieve breakthrough results using the same continuous improvement principles leveraged by companies such as Toyota, Del Monte, and the U.S. Department of Defense. And now, here's your host, Ron Pereira. Hey there, this is Ron Pereira with Gimba Academy, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of the Gimba Academy podcast. As always, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and your week to listen to the show and for watching our Lean and Six Sigma training videos over at GimbaAcademy.com. We definitely appreciate each and every one of you. Now, today I'm excited to welcome Josh Sanchez to the show. Now, uh, Josh and I kind of uh, uh, met each other, I guess, if you will, over email and LinkedIn and uh, uh, come to find he's got a pretty interesting background. Uh, He spent some time um, in the jewelry industry, and uh, then he actually went on to work at at Toyota. And uh, so today, what we kind of talk about on the show is his early journey in that uh, jewelry industry. It's a pretty uh, interesting industry to be practicing lean. And and, uh, so, so here's some fun stories there. And then, uh, then we really dive in deep into his experiences uh, at Toyota. Um, you know, he really started as a frontline employee and just kind of uh, worked through the system. And he, he really pulls the curtain back, if you will, and and uh, just gives us his uh, his his perspective on on how things work there. Um, talks about the first time he pulled his andon and all the rest of it. So really, really fun episode. Now, Josh, as you'll hear towards the end, is actually transitioning into the uh, lean healthcare industry. So we we kind of wrap the show up with a little discussion on that. Um, um, so I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, he was a great guy to talk to, super humble, and uh, and really really fun to really fun guy to to uh, converse with. So show notes for this particular episode can be found over at GembaPodcast.com. Just look for episode 153. Again, GembaPodcast.com and look for episode 153. Okay, enough from me. Let's get to the show. All right, Josh. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Lexington, Kentucky today, sir. All right. Home of the uh, the Wildcats, I guess, and Kentucky basketball. Are you a big fan or what? <laughs> I, you know, I get razzed a lot for this. So I'm not from Kentucky originally, uh, and I was never a college sports fan. Okay. But uh, I like them okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'll root for them when they're, when they're playing. But, well, you know, you know I, good team to jump on the bandwagon, you know. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big bandwagon team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good yeah. stuff, good stuff. All right. Well, thanks for coming on to the show. I'm really excited. You got a great, great background and can't wait to hear your story. But uh, let's go ahead and kind of kick things off, Josh, with you uh, g- giving us a quote of something that possibly inspires you. Sure. I think... I think you may have had somebody mention this quote before, but I'm, I'm going to go a little bit more in, in depth with to it. It's Taichi Ono's quote, uh, and the quote is, we are all human and we are wrong half of the time. Mm. I, the first time I heard that, I think that really struck with me. And that that quote comes from from his book, uh, Workplace Management. Mm. But if you if you look at the page before that, he's talking about making mistakes. And one of the things that he says, it's it's not so much that we're wrong half the time, but he says, if you're wrong, don't hesitate to correct yourself. Mm. And I found that that, that really struck a chord with me. Mm -hmm. I've worked in uh, plenty of situations where humility was simply not part of the job aspect. Yeah. And I think that's, that's critical. Uh, Plus to admit that we're wrong a lot of times. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah, I just finished a, an awesome book. Uh, I I talked about on a several podcasts ago. Um, this uh, ego or our uh, obstacles, the way I talked about. But this Ryan Holiday wrote another book called Ego is the Enemy, and uh, oh, it's so powerful. Just talking about you know how kind of you know all these great people in our in the history of of how they were so brilliant. Like uh, Howard Hughes was an example he used. Like the guy was like the their modern their day, their days Elon Musk, right? And but this guy had such an ego that it just can you know, he was ultimately nowhere near as successful as he could have been, right? And uh, I think humility is is so important, um, especially as it relates to to lean, right? And really life in general, but uh, for sure with lean. So that's a great, great quote. Well, Josh, why don't you uh, kind of kick things off a little bit by uh, telling us a little bit about your your background and, and maybe how you first came to learn about continuous improvement. Sure thing, Ron. So I actually spent 17 years in the jewelry industry. I had a high school jewelry class. I was always somewhat artistic, and I thought, you know, maybe I can actually 
make a living making jewelry. Mm. And so I, I sought out an apprenticeship, and uh, one thing led to another. I did just about everything within that industry possible, from sales to repair, CAD design, uh, administrative work, and finally I ended up at Tiffany & Company, uh, one of their manufacturing facilities, and they had uh, three master black belts hmm. that they'd had for a while, and they found that the master black belts simply weren't enough. They needed more, and so they decided that they were going to you know, interview internally and semi-promote. Uh, is basically giving more responsibility to uh, at least 20 more people uh, to make green belts. And I was simply looking for a voice within the company. And my plant manager is like, yeah, definitely go for it. Uh, he had some lean background as, as well. And uh, I, I got it. And that pretty much set it off. Hmm. Uh, I was then part of their Lean Six Sigma committee. Mm -hmm. And that's what gave me my, my first taste of, of what lean actually was. It was something that I'd always done before. Mm -hmm. You know, I was always trying to improve things. I just didn't realize that there was actually names for some of these processes, like 5S. Yeah. And I, so just from there, I, that, that pretty much set it off. That's, mm -hmm. that, was, that was my first taste of organized lean we'll call it so 17 years in the jewelry industry like so how, how long into it was it that you when that that thing kicked off like the the lean and six sigma stuff that kicked off was that like halfway through or how many years did you practice it there i guess so i was a lean practitioner with tiffany's for about a year and a half okay so it was actually really late into my career as a as a jeweler, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. Like, what did you do? Like, what does a lean thinker do in a jewelry industry? I'm curious, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's obviously a very craft-oriented work, I would think, right? So It is, and, and, and that, was part of, uh, that was part of what was not hard for me, but we're looking at, so it was more Lean Six Sigma, so it's, you know, reducing variation mm -hmm. within your processes. You know, and I'm looking at how our jewelers are trained and... How our jewelers, uh, you know, create, you know, the, the, these different pieces on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, we might have 50 different jewelers in, in this section that set the same product 50 different ways. Mm. And then we're wondering why we have, you know, quality. Because they have, Tiffany's has extremely stringent quality specifications. Mm -hmm. It's like, and then we wonder why we're having, you know, all of this, the, the, not quality defects, but they're just, they're, they're outside of our specs. Mm -hmm. So you, we've got to send them back and get them repaired. I mean, if the, if the stone is tilted just a little bit, yeah, you see, kicks that right back. Like, nope, you, you gotta, you gotta fix that. And yeah, I kept telling them, I was like, look, we can standardize this. We can have it to where everything is, you know, let, let's try to get it to where the jewelers are, are doing the, the same way. And mm -hmm. I kept being told, no, you can't do that. This is a craft. <laughs> We're different. Like, well, uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm, I'm like, no, you can't do that. I was like, what, why? Why yeah. can't you do it differently? Yeah. Why, why, you know, he kept hearing, well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, maybe if we did it different, we could yeah. avoid some of these. So, and that was actually one of the things that I, I worked on was we, redid the the jeweler trainer program you know so that was part of i i was the the lead for that project it was basically going back okay what are all of the things that we teach to to income and jewelers mm -hmm. or individuals that are stepping into those roles and do we need to teach them all of these things are there things that we need to teach them going back to the the team leads how do you train you know basically it was it was standardizing that's yeah. that's that's what it was. It was how can we get everybody on board so the trainers are training one thing, then they get out onto the floor and the team leads are teaching the same way. Yeah. That way we can avoid this variation. And um, it actually it, it worked really well. But so that that was the type of thing. I, I worked on a couple of training programs. I worked on a, an inventory inventory control. Uh, we found that we had some some gaps there. Mm -hmm. So that was it, it was process related. Yeah, I've I've met a. Uh, 
I don't know how many people in my life that have been practicing lean. I mean, thousands and thousands, but you're the first one I've ever met that had had anything to do with the (laughs) jewelry industry. So that's really cool. Really cool. All right. Well, so I guess I know, you know, from talking to you before we recorded and just over email and whatnot, that uh, you actually went to uh, work at the big T (laughs) Toyota. Um, (laughs) So I guess my question, first question is what, what, what led you and how, how did you end up there? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Thanks, Ron. So, uh, first of all, honestly, a lot of this I can blame you you for that. Uh, (laughs) uh, So I had a I had a a colleague that uh, listened to to your when I first started in Italy, and he listened to your podcast. He's like, hey, you know, you know, check him out. He's like, it's just pretty interesting. I was like, okay. And so I started at the beginning, and you know, as I'd mentioned, the the first episode that really hit me um, in, in more than just this is really interesting information, mm-hmm. um, more on a, a life changing type of, uh, event was, was episode 15 with Mike Grogan oh, where yeah. he's talking about his time in Tanzania mm. and I, you know, I, I'm listening to the, he's a very passionate individual. Yeah. You can tell just by you know, just listening to him or, or reading breathes. any of his work. <laughs> yeah. When he breathes, yeah. he's passionate. It, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, and, and he's sitting here and he's, he's talking about, you know, how he's, you know, reducing waste and, and eliminating waste in, in, you know, these developing country. And how he's helping you know, from a healthcare standpoint, and um, you know, I got really emotional actually listening to that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is this is one of those you know light bulb type moments. Like, I I, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I I don't know how, but that's what I want to do. And I actually called my wife at lunch, and I says, I know what we're we're gonna do because she's very uh, she's very charitable. Uh, my wife is, and and so that I knew that would be right up her alley. You know, if I talk about you know let's let's travel the world and and. Uh, not as tourists, but let's go and try to help people. Um, I knew that she, she'd be like, okay, yeah. And, and she was like, that sounds great. How do you do that? I was like, I have no idea. We'll, we'll look at that down the road, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe when we retire. But at some point, that's what I want to do. And from there, the, the next podcast that hit me was the, let's see, was it episode 30, I believe? Yeah, episode 30 with, with – um, Tracy and Ernie Richardson. I knew you were going to say that. I yeah. knew it. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, they spent, um, and, and Tracy in particular. She, yeah. in that, I believe it's in that podcast. She's talking about how she, you know, Toyota had came here to to Georgetown. I think she was eighteen. She had applied for college, but she had applied for Toyota as well. And then, you know, a little bit before she's supposed to start college, she gets the call hmm. to to go work, and she had to make a decision. She was like, "Okay, do I do I go work at Toyota?" Which was, I mean, at that point in time, you know, brand new. Yeah, you've heard of Toyota, but you, you, I would imagine there wasn't, well, of course, there wasn't the type of buzz now about it. Yeah. So, I mean, she had no idea what she was really walking into. Is, is It's that or do I go to college and get a degree? And she decided to go to Toyota. And, you know, she mentions in that that, you know, she learned so much from Toyota that it was worth more than any degree ever would have been. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think I agree with her. And so I'm sitting here at Tiffany's. And what I'm seeing, the difference between the interviews that you're doing with, with individuals and what I'm experiencing at mm-hmm. Tiffany's and what I found was that there was a, a culture gap. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's Toyota way. I was like, that's, that's the element that's missing between what I'm doing here and what Toyota has. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was at a crossroads. Uh, I had two choices. Um, we had lost one of our master black belts. They had, had moved to, uh, to somewhere else. I was like, I can pursue a master black belt and try to step into that role here at, here at, uh, Tiffany's. Um, I could pursue an MBA and maybe with that, you know, move upper management of some sort, or I could go to Toyota. My wife, honestly, I don't think she likes the Toyota idea. Hmm. And we, I mean, yeah, She's not materialistic, but if you look at, we're going to make a fine high-end jewelry or cars, mm-hmm. I think most women are going to say stick with the jewelry. Yeah. And so finally I was like, well, let's, let's go on the tour at least. So me and my, my wife and two kids, we went, I set up and we went to the tour uh, of uh, Toyota Georgetown. And, you know, we step in the visitor center and I mean, immediately it's like, I want to work here. <laughs> I don't care you know, what it takes. This is where I want to be. Mm. About halfway through the tour, my wife turns around. She's like, you want to work here, don't you? Mm. I was like, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. And uh, my daughter, she's so funny. She was the same way. She was like, can 
I work here? I, I want it. I mean, she, she's nine. She was like, I want to do this. Like, what do I have to do? <laughs> it's like, well, we'll talk later. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was such a cool experience. And just to be able to see that and hear the passion of the tour guides about Toyota. And I, I finally, I felt, you know what, if, if lean is what I want to do, there's no better place for me to learn than at Toyota. Mm -hmm. And it was 20 miles down the road. Yeah. I figured I'm going to gain more from that than any master black belt or any NBA right. uh, degree or certificate. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I, I applied and, and I went. So what did you, when was this? This, gosh, it took a long time. This would have been May of 2015. Okay. It took, so I talked with the tour guide afterwards and I was, I was asking him, I was like, so what do I have to do to work here? And he's like, well, everybody comes in as a, as a temporary worker on the floor. Um, that's the way they manage their, their, um, staffing or whatever. Their, their, yeah. Their staff, yeah. Essentially. Yeah. yeah that, that, that's how they maintain the, the, their staffing. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, everybody comes in on the floor to me, honestly, I thought, well, that's, that's great. Have everybody come in on the floor, mm -hmm. you know, learn firsthand frontline yeah. worker, and then yeah. you can move into whatever role you need to. I was like, that's brilliant. I was like, okay, sign me up. And so you, you go through a, a temp service, uh, and you're, you're essentially a temporary variable workforce team member. Um, but it took eight months for me to get through the process. Oh, wow. Uh, which I was not expecting. Okay. So <laughs> here I am, I've, I've applied and you know, I'm still plugging away at, at Tiffany's and just waiting for those callbacks. Yeah. Uh, from, from the, from the temp service. So it, right. it took about eight months. So it was January of last year mm -hmm. that I started at Toyota. Okay. All right. So, what was it like? What was what, your first day like? What'd you do? So first, I think first three days were orientation. Okay. And so it's just sitting in a conference room, watch PowerPoint kind of thing or pretty much, okay. pretty much you know, you're filling out your, your basic paperwork. Mm -hmm. uh, they're giving you, but what I found was great about it. Everything though, is they, they start teaching TPS into it away immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I know, you know, day one, they're they're talking about the history, and they're talking about andons mm -hmm. and kaizans, mm -hmm. and so I mean, you you've got people that have no way heard about any of these mm -hmm. types of principles or methodologies, but right away they're they're teaching those mm -hmm. uh, to what's going to be their their yeah. new frontline workers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so all right. Yes. So you get through your orientation three days. Yeah. Then, so then what? I've got, yeah. I've got like three days through orientation and then you go through uh, a basic skills training where it's essentially, um, you know, regardless of, let's see, it depends on, so I ended up going into powertrain. I was in their powertrain division. So basically I, I build engines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've got fundamental skills and, and we're talking around from the very basics up They're They're talking, you know, um, putting a bolt into a hole mm -hmm. and hand starting it mm -hmm. so that it, you know, so that when you, when it, when the bolt is shot down, you know, it shoots down straight, you know, and it's tight and everything. Um, I mean, we're talking about they're, they're teaching, okay, can you put 15 bolts into this board in you know 30 seconds or whatever the time frame might be? Mm -hmm. Uh, so that it was literally, these are the, the basically they were going through TWI. Yeah, that was, or, that was going to be my that, question. Was it kind of job instruction yeah. where they're talking about important steps, key points, that's, and reasons for the key points? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's what it was. Nice. It was, these are the steps you take, these are why you take them. And what was really funny, too, is the the dojo trainers, they're like, look, I know in orientation you guys talked about improvements, you know, you're encouraged to offer improvements, mm -hmm. don't offer them here. This isn't, th this is detailed, structured training. Yes, we're aware that there might be a faster way to do that. That's not what we're trying to teach you right now. We're just trying to teach you the fundamental basics of what you might be doing when, when you step out hmm, onto the That's lawn. interesting. Okay, cool, cool. So, it, and it basically it was just so, I mean, that there reduces the variation. You know, if you start getting all of these suggestions, I mean, they're like, look, if there's something that's unsafe, bring that up. Yeah. But as far as, you know, the steps that we're taking, yeah. this is the way we have it structured for this reason so that we can make sure that we're teaching yeah. what you just, you know, all of the important steps, why you do it, how you do it, when you do it, yeah. all, all of those things. Yeah. So when they were trading, we were like, we're, you know, obviously I, we were talking before we came on, we were about to release our JI course and, you know, we, we really kind of harp on the language, like make sure that you mention the words, the first important step is like, <laughs> were they pretty dogmatic like that or how, how did that go? 
you know, and I can't speak for, for all of the dojo trainers. My trainers were relatively laid back. Uh-huh. Uh, in some sense, it was obviously structured. Yeah. So I don't think that they had, if they had scripted points. Did they have breakdowns it, it, and it whatnot didn't. that they were using or? You know, they, I, they were pretty good trainers. They, I they mean, probably had memorized, was, obviously. Yeah, everything right? was pretty much memorized. I <laughs> yeah. don't think I ever remember seeing any of them with notes. Yeah, <laughs> to, yeah, to, interesting. To be okay. honest, unless when they were, you know, a, after we got out of that and we're in the yeah. in a classroom setting, because we had, gosh, another thing, I think we had two days of that, uh-huh. and then we had classroom setting where they start going over a lot of the things they went over in orientation again. We start talking about the forms of waste uh-huh. and, um, again, the history, Kaizen, customer first, you know, and that's what, that, that's when they started aspects. playing all the Gimba Academy videos in, right? Not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Just kidding. <laughs> all right. So, talk a little bit now. Let's fast forward. Oh, I don't know. Uh, three months from the, right. you know, you've been working there for three months. Like, what's a day in a life like then at that point? Sure. I'm, uh, we're going to be honest. It's very repetitive, which mm-hmm. would make sense. You know, mm-hmm. again, you're talking about a an assembly line. Yeah. Bottom line is it's an assembly line. You're doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Um, but what I really liked about Toyota, and this was when, when I went through the, the tour, they were talking about this too, is, you know, so you've got a couple of rotations a day. These rotations are split into a couple of hours and then they will, you know, when, when you're, you're trained up on jobs, they rotate you through these jobs, you know, trying to make sure that you aren't using, you know, the same. So let's say you've got to turn an engine on one job. Um, you know, they will try to make sure that on the next job you're avoiding that, mm. which you know is looking at employee safety. Yeah, to to make sure that you're not, you know, you're not ending up with those repetitive motion injuries. Yeah, and uh, you know, one of the things that you know they before we went out to the line, you know, we'd have a you know a little stand up meeting, um, you know, talking about you know if there was any change points or anything like that that it that it maybe had occurred or where we were at, and you know the one thing that I liked is. Before we would go out to line, they'd say, watch your safety and quality. And safety was always first. The quality was right after it. And they really meant that. You know, you hear a lot of times, you know, at work, oh, be safe. Mm-hmm. No, they, they really mean If they tell you to be safe, they mean be safe. Yeah. If there's a problem, they want to know. If there's a quality issue, they want to know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it was. Did you ever pull the end on? A, a daily basis. You did, yeah. What well, was the first time daily. you ever pulled it? What was it Gosh. like? What, what Do you remember what it was, the situation? I, I don't even remember what it was for, but it was such. How did you pain. feel? <laughs> Were you nervous? Yeah. No, I was. And see, and that's just it, you know, because so when, when you first start, they put you with the trainer. And at least where I was, um, you trained on two jobs. Now, I, I don't believe this is specifically necessary in, in every area, but at least where I was, mm-hmm. uh, I trained on two jobs for basically five weeks. Mm-hmm. And so I'd just rotate between those two jobs every rotation. Um, but that was meant to one, it was to make sure that you didn't get overwhelmed because, you know, you're talking about, you know, a, you know, this process that you have, you know, depending on which, which area and powertrain you're at, you, your tack time might be anywhere from 45 seconds to two minutes. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you're talking about an average tack time around 60 seconds and you've got to do all of these different things to this engine, you know, that can get pretty nerve wracking. Yeah. And it's like, you know, cause not only do you have to do them, but you have to do them correctly. Right. So that you don't, you know, that a defect isn't caused. And so they give you a lot of time to get you up to speed so that you're, and, and part of that, again, is is safety of, of the employee mm-hmm. so that people aren't pushing themselves so hard right off the bat. So like when I first started my first week, I was only supposed to do 25% of the process. Or if I picked it up really quickly, maybe I'm only doing one out of every four engines. Mm-hmm. You know, and then it just ramps up from there so that by the end of my training, i I have, uh, you know, I can do it comfortably, intact time, with quality. I know the standards. And so it was, I'm with a trainer for five weeks, and they pulled the end on all the time. Hmm. Um, regardless, you know, on if there's any abnormality, they mean that. Any abnormality, you pull the end on something doesn't look right, mm-hmm. something didn't feel right when you're putting on, you're running low on parts, whatever it might be, you mm-hmm. pull your end on. And so it was, it quickly became second nature that, uh, you know, and what I like too is the team leads, obviously, because of the you know, respect for people, they don't come up and they're like, what's good? You know, it wasn't, you know, a harsh, like, you know, why, why, why did you stop the line? Yeah. Type of thing. Uh, it's, you know, what's going on? You know, how can I help you? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you know, team leads have better days than others, but for mm-hmm. the most part, you know, everything was 
very respectful. And yeah. so I was, you know, I, I honestly can't remember <laughs> what the first thing I pulled the end on was yeah. because I did it even when I was in training, you know, I had full authorization to pull the end on then. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it was, you know, just a way of li- way of life. So what was different? Let's compare maybe kind of, uh, and I'm not trying to poke at any one company or another, so I don't, sure. don't take it that way, but w- maybe compare your, your previous lean experience with, uh, with your Toyota lean experience. Like what was, uh, how do they compare? Yeah. So I, like I said, I, I think, so, I mean, officially I have two different employers where, where, where I've had, you know, lean experience. Like I said, I, I did it and, and other places before, just not knowing that it was mm-hmm. lean. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think the the main thing really was the cultural aspect. Mm. It was uh, at you know pre- at my previous employer, it was you know there there were top down directives. You know the um, upper management decided these are the things we need to focus on, and then that those were the directives given to us as as far as our our projects were concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I love about Toyota is that. Yes, we have those, and some of those are retroactively implemented. You know, something is going wrong for whatever reason, and so then they're like, look, this is something we need to address, and then, you know, th- those types of things are problem solved, but a lot of it really is frontline worker driven. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, and it can be something as small as, as Kaizen's to, you know, like, look, um, you know, this, this, uh, this wrench is on the left side of the engine, but the part that we put it on, mm-hmm. we use it for is on the right side of the engine. So why can't we just switch it, mm-hmm. move it to the other side? Mm-hmm. You know, now you're looking at ergonomics, you're looking at less movement. Uh, and so you, some of the things are as simple as that. Uh, and those types of changes happen honestly on, on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Um, what's funny is when I got, t- when I was going to Toyota, I thought, well, they've been doing this, you know, for nearly 30 years now in Kentucky. There's, I'm not going to be able to do anything. I'm right. just going to sit back and watch because there's nothing that needs improved. They've, they've done them all already, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's the beauty of continuous improvement. There's always something that can be done yeah. even marginally better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was, I think the biggest difference was the frontline worker involvement. Nice. It's that it's... They strongly encourage, I mean, not even that it's encouraged. I mean, it's almost even expected. Look, yeah. if you're doing something different, please let us know so that we can evaluate it. And if it's going to be something that helps everybody, we want to make sure it's, it's implemented. Exactly. So, I, you know, I, I know that you, you, you were trained a lot before Toyota and went through a bunch of different types of training. Obviously, probably read a book or two about Toyota. <laughs> I um, did. Was there anything different? I don't know, different from what you expected or discrepancies be- between what you thought you knew about Toyota and what, what Toyota really is? There, there were. And it was funny because I was, and, and I guess I was kind of preempted with, with this possibility. One of my dojo trainers actually pulled me aside and he's like, look, I understand that, you know, I, I talked about him about my background. He's like, don't be surprised if you get out there and some things are a little bit different. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's not what I signed up for. What are you talking about? And, and really what it was, it's just, it's difference of opinions it is really, I think, what it is. Toyota as a company is pretty much everything I read about, everything I expected. Mm-hmm. But I think what happens sometimes in particular is that, again, remember, I thought everybody started on the line. Mm-hmm. I come to learn later that isn't exactly the case. Um, so when you have engineers, engineers are, are hired in. Um, you know, from off the street. So they might not have TPS experience. Mm. And so I, I think one of the the first time that I saw what I viewed as a discrepancy was we had, uh, you know, the engine comes down the conveyor and then there's a place where it, it shifts to, to a different conveyor. And there's a couple of engines there just basically there as a buffer for transportation time because they can't teleport from one side of the conveyor to the other. Mm-hmm. And... I saw them, um, they were building out the, the conveyor line. They're extending it. And I was like, okay, I thought, you know, we were getting a new engine. I thought maybe we're having new processes or, or whatever it might be. And I come to find out that, no, they're adding, uh, they're basically extending the conveyor line for, to add more of a buffer. Mm. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. Tayochi Ono said that, you know, you, you reduce your inventory. Mm-hmm. W- when you see stuff stacked up, that, that's excess, that's waste. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's not how it's supposed to be, right? Mm-hmm. And I, finally, it bothered me so much, I went to one of my team leads, and I was like, hey, what's, 
why, why are we building in inventory? Mm-hmm. Uh, because all that's going to do is, yes, we're making a buffer, but that's just going to, if we're having problems, that's going to hide the problem so you can't see it. And he actually agreed with me. He's like, you know, I'm not really sure. He says, you know, but that's just the difference in engineers. He says, our, our last engineer that we had in here was huge anti-buffer. Mm-hmm. And then this guy, the, the, the new engineer that we had in here was like, look, if, we, if we're having problems, it's going to make us run better. We're going to add buffers. Uh, and then we can evaluate those later mm. uh, if, if, they, if they need to be reduced or, or whatever it might be. And so I think that was, and, but that was just a difference in opinion. It wasn't necessarily Toyota. It was just this specific engineer yeah. Yeah. viewed things a little bit differently. So did they add it? So they added it. They, they did. Um, and it was, and they have reduced it. Uh-huh. It, it was, it was, and I think part of it was, you know, I will say this was above my pay grade, but I, from what my understanding of the situation was, is was because of the new engine that was coming in, we were expecting certain levels of downtime. We were expecting that mm-hmm. everything wasn't going to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And so it was, how can we keep the line running smoothly while we're working through all of these Kaizans and sure. problem solving scenarios to get us up to speed? Yeah. Um, well, if anything, I mean, maybe that gives people listening uh, some reason to take a deep breath and be like, oof, you know, I mean, <laughs> right, even Toyota's right. not perfect, right? So, but yeah. they're constantly trying and making improvements just like we all should be. So, so that's a, that's a really cool story. So, um, well, let's kind of wrap, maybe just wrap this section up with uh, some more everyday scenarios. You know, I, I'm just always fascinated from people that have actually worked there. I never, obviously never worked at Toyota. So, you know, were there any other everyday scenarios that were, were kind of cool for the your frontline workers? So what I think, and this is something that honestly, I, I think any organization, you know, should, should have. Uh, so one thing that they have is they're, they're called quality circles. Mm-hmm. Basically it's uh, frontline led problem solving think tanks Mm -hmm. basically and so you know i was fortunate enough that i was able to go and be trained as a quality circle leader and so then i i ran my own quality circle and you know you're you're meeting um either after shift or at lunch and you're essentially going through eight step problem solving every day Um, not every day okay um, but once a week okay once a week but with for my circle in particular we you know we're, we're very active and so we would talk about things basically every day when you know, w- w- sorry to interrupt. Just quick question: eight steps. So, kind of what we would call PP practical problem solving, like yes. break down the problem, set a target. Yep. That could, okay, cool. Yep. Okay, exactly. That's it. And it, what what this did though is it empowered your your frontline employees. So you know, you're all kaizans happen every day. You know, we're encouraged every day to to make these small changes. You know, but what they talked about is with a kaizan, you know what the solution is. Mm-hmm. With a quality circle theme. You know there's a problem here. You look very macro mm-hmm. at first. Mm-hmm. And then you break it down from there mm-hmm. until you're focusing in on one thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then you go through the steps of, you know, uh, of resolving that issue. You know, come, you know root cause analysis, mm-hmm. problem, um, coming up with countermeasures, uh, countermeasure, yeah. seeing the countermeasure through, mm-hmm. you know, making sure that, you know, following up with that countermeasure, standardizing. Mm-hmm. And... So what this did, though, what, what I felt that this did is this empowered the frontline workers to an even greater extent that, you know, this was a problem that was above just them. This isn't something where I can just fix this by moving this part here mm-hmm. and that's going to fix the problem. This is this is a problem. I have no idea how to fix it. But then you're teaching your your frontline workers how to go through these problem solving steps mm-hmm. so that, you know, when they move on to team lead positions or, or whatever it might be down the road or even just stay in frontline workers, they have this problem solving mentality. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the ingenuity and innovation that I've seen at Toyota is some of the best I've ever seen anywhere I've worked. Mm-hmm. And I think Personally, I credit a lot of that to the fact that, you know, you, you've got Kaizans and you've got quality circles where you are fostering this culture of problem solving. Now, and with as a day to day basis. Yeah. So as it relates to Kaizen, like what, you know, in a traditional lean set the world, you know, Kaizen events, right? Very popular, three, right. five day blitzes, if you will. Are, how, how often are those going on or did you participate so in them? They, they do have those. I, uh, I did not participate in one of those. Those tend to be. Um, there's a different department mm-hmm. that, that, which, which, which was interesting, but you know, there's, there's different departments that would, that would come in at some point in time, um, to, to look at those types of mm-hmm. 
those type of events, and you know, and they would pull a couple of the you know, the more experienced frontline workers mm-hmm. to, to help participate with those. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not have the opportunity to to participate in one of those, but yes, they do. They 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 would do that as well. Mm-hmm. So they would have what you would consider your traditional, you know, five. I think most of those are five days. You know, okay. five day kaizen events, uh, and then otherwise your kaizens were. Every day, <laughs> every day. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. Every day, you know, there's a form, you know, and it, and it was funny is I didn't even realize until recently there was actually a form that you fill out if you had a kaizen because the way I was looking at, it, I would just let my group lead or my team lead know, hey, look, this is the issue. Mm-hmm. Do you think we could change this? Um, and you know, and a lot of times, you know, they would just apparently they were taking care of that form, but there was, mm-hmm. I mean, there was an official form too that you could fill out. You know, like this is what I want to change. This is why I want to change it. Uh, this is why I believe it'll be beneficial, you know, and that's discussed with you know between the two different shifts, mm-hmm. uh, first shift, second shift, mm-hmm. and if everybody was in agreement, yeah, that w- that's actually going to make things better. And they just went ahead, and then they'd go ahead and do it. Very cool. Go ahead and make the change. Very cool. So uh, I understand that you're actually getting ready to transition to something different, though. What's going on there? <laughs> I, I am. So this kind of went back to that. Uh, that first podcast with, I with Mike, with, yeah, with Mike, yeah. You know, also, I, I I wanted to move to healthcare, and there's a a, a guy at church that I I go. Uh, there's a guy I go to church with. And about six months ago, he uh, he learned I, I worked for Toyota, and he starts talking to me, and we start having these conversations about Toyota and how it works. I had no idea what he did, but what I found out is he's a basically he's a professor of basically lean healthcare Mm -hmm. at the University of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, have you ever thought about switching to healthcare? I was like, well, I have. I have no idea how to do it. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, here's a course you should take. And he, the Institute of uh, Healthcare Improvement has a a course on uh, basic uh, patient safety and quality, Mm -hmm. which is essentially... um, it, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's lean that that's mm-hmm. all there is to it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I took that course. I was like, that was very interesting. You know, I, I, I'd, I'd kind of like to, to do that. He's like, well, okay, now I'll talk to this guy. And, uh, he sends me the contact information of the director of the, uh, office for value of, uh, innovation and healthcare delivery at the university of Kentucky. I call him up and he invites me in to uh, just have a sit down. I'm basically thinking, you know, I'd like to get into healthcare. I'm probably going to need a degree in healthcare or something. Mm-hmm. I figured he's going to tell me, well, you know, go get this degree, come back in three years, and, mm-hmm. and we'll talk. And uh, we had about an hour conversation. About 45 minutes into it, he he asked, "Are well, is this something that you're looking to move into? Is healthcare?" I was like, "Yeah, I am." It's like, "Well, are you looking to move now?" And I, I kind of was like. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me more. Yeah. And uh, so he had a he had an open position coming up, and he's like, you know, why don't he's like, I I feel you you do a great job in it with your background with your education. He's like, apply for it. Um, the job wasn't posted yet. He's like, apply for it, and it will bring you in for an interview, and we'll we'll go from there. Mm-hmm. And uh, apparently they they felt that I was qualified for it, which wow. I was very thankful for. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I uh, I'll start that. Pretty soon, uh, basically, I will be um, essentially it's it's process improvement specialist and trainer. Yeah, um, within the UK healthcare circle. Yeah, well, very cool. Yeah, we were talking, uh, you know, before we came on the recording here that uh, you got to connect. I know you already have a little bit with Mark, Mark Raven, Skip Stewart, Brandon Brown, all these uh, folks, Michael Lombard, tons of amazing lean thinkers in the. Uh, in the healthcare world and, you know, Theta Care and just all the rest of it. It's, so, it's such an exciting uh, time, really, for, for healthcare and, and, and lean in particular, how we right. can uh, how we can improve it. So, well, well g- good luck with that. And uh, Thank you. perhaps we can, uh, we'll have you come back on, I don't know, in six months and you're like, well, so what, I'll ask you the same <laughs> questions. What was different about right. what? <laughs> yeah. 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 Very cool. All right. Well, let's go ahead and transition into the, uh, into the reflection section. Josh, so the uh, the first question, and I know you listen to the show, so you kind of know what I'm going to say. But uh, you know, we do spend a lot of time, in particular, you know, the the kind of Toyota principles, right? Respect for people and and, and continuous improvement. And uh, respect for people is all, obviously a lot harder to kind of wrap your arms around and to define. So I'm curious, what does it mean to you to respect people? Sure. And so I grew up in we'll call a very command and control environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just way I think my, my father was raised and that's the way I saw um, this might be 
my father works for GM. Okay. Um, has for years. And, and I think uh, a lot of their, I'm not saying now, but you know, you know, 20 years ago, their management structure was, was a lot of that same way. So, so to me, growing up in that type of environment, um, that's what I saw. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's how you did it. Mm-hmm. You know, you, yeah, I know more. I'm the boss or the father or mm-hmm. parent or who the oldest, whatever it might be. I'll you know, think so you do. I'll, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, I was like, that's the way you do it, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, if you want something done right, you do it yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's the type of mentality I had. And, and so as I transitioned into to a more of a, a lean mind, uh, I moved into what I consider now serve and inspire. That's hmm. what, what, I, what I consider and I, I realized that, you know, respect really is, um, you know, you, you've got the golden rule, but then you've got the platinum rule, which is, you know, do, uh, you know, you treat others how they want to be treated. Mm. And, and you, you know, you look at, you know, respect for people and then you hear the definition, well, it's respect for uh, humanity. And I've, I've, for me personally, I, I've realized that it's, it's almost even a step further. It's not even just humanity because that's, that's humanity is dealing with people you know, the human race, but it's respect for life mm. in general. Um, and I think I, I first realized that when you know, we've, we've got two cats, you know, they're, they're about a year old. So, you know, they're, we're learning, you know, teaching them, you know, you don't get on the counter, <laughs> you know, all these other things, you know, and what do you do? You, you spray them with a spray bottle or, you know, you yell at them, you know, and my wife's like, why are you doing that? She's like, you don't yell at the kids. You don't spray them with bottles. <laughs> Oh, I, we spray our kids all the time. Really? Not <laughs> kidding. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> growing out of it at least. And so, you know, and I'm like, you know, that's actually a good point. I'd never thought of that. Yeah. You know, I would imagine the cat doesn't want to be treated like that. Now, it's we're still in the experimentation phase. I'm not sure if me respecting them is actually making our relationship better or not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm trying to think so. And and so, you, to me, respect is it's it's all aspects. It's not just just people it's you know it's relationships and, yeah. and everything that's involved and I think Toyota does a great job with that as well if you look at um, you know they don't just talk about developing their people and respecting others but it's you know respecting people in your community mm-hmm. it's not not even so much that but just um, environmentally yeah you know it's you know they, I mean yeah it, you know exactly. how can we respect the world yeah itself exactly at, and so that's to me that's what respect is it's it's all encompassing of yeah. How, how can I just be thoughtful and understanding of, of everything? Yeah. What's the best advice you've ever received? <laughs> that was from my wife. <laughs> so I, well, we'll see if she listens to this or not. Um, I've told her this before that I was like, if I ever go on that show, this is what I'm going to tell them was my best <laughs> advice. And so I, uh, like I said, I was in the jewelry industry a long time. My goal from the very beginning was I was going to own my own store and make lots of money. And then when I made lots of money, I could go out and I could help other people. But, you know, making lots of money was, was the number one priority. So I started working for myself in 2007. And in 2008, the two <laughs> jewelers that I worked the most with, yeah, you know where this is going. Mm-hmm. They were like, hey, why don't we start a store? I'm like, that's what I've always wanted. Yeah, let's do that. So we, you know, went out, did all that we had to do to uh, – to to start a small store um we were basically running a a high-end custom jewelry shop is basically what we were doing this was in the spring of 2008 Mm. Uh, everybody knows what happened that fall yeah it collapsed Mm -hmm. like no other i mean it our december which is normally a big month felt like any month during the summer Mm -hmm. Uh, it was it wasn't a good time for a lot of people it definitely wasn't a good time to start your own business Mm -hmm. So I ended up walking away from the business about a year later. Um, I just, it, it was not, I could not sustain mm-hmm. <laughs> my family anymore off of uh, what we were, we were trying to do there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually when I went to, to Tiffany and company, I got fortunate enough to, to step into that company. Um, but at, at Tiffany and company, basically the only position they had was an operations assistant and working in the Indianapolis store. Um, I was, you know, so I, I'm, checking in merchandise and helping take in customer repairs. And I'm going to be honest, I was pretty miserable individual and I was probably pretty miserable to be around. Mm. And my wife, I think at one point was finally tired. And this was, this is the advice. She said, she was like, Josh, you got two choices, either be happy or not. And there wasn't that ultimatum at the end of it, mm-hmm. but it was kind of like, look, you, you need to be happy because this isn't working for us. Mm-hmm. 
And that was a wake up call. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? All of this has been a reflection of my own, you know, self pity of, you know, my dream fell apart, et cetera, you know. And it's like, she's right. Yeah, I do have a choice. Mm-hmm. Everybody has that choice whether or not they're going to be happy or not, that positive at, uh, personality or uh, outlook on life. And so from that day until today, anytime something goes wrong, I'm like, well, Josh, you've got two choices. You know, you can dwell on the negativity of it or you can try to look at the bright side, even though sometimes that silver lining is hard to find, um, but take it as a learning experience. Yeah. And I think that goes back to why Taichi Ono's quote hit me so hard is that, you know, we're wrong 50% of the time. And on the flip side, sometimes things go wrong 50% of the time. Mm-hmm. And so how are you going to correct that and, and just be happy anyways? Yeah, I mentioned earlier in the show that book Obstacles Away by Ryan Holiday and can't recommend it enough. And it's, a lot of it, it is rooted in uh, stoicism and like Marcus Aurelius, you know, the old guy from Gladiator and Marcus Aurelius had this famous right. quote. He says, choose not to be harmed and you won't feel right. harmed. Don't feel harmed and you haven't been, you know. Right. And uh, so I think your wife is a uh, is a uh, Marcus Aurelius disciple, <laughs> if she, even if she doesn't realize it. <laughs> so it's pretty powerful pretty powerful. So what are you most proud of as it relates to your, your journey with, with lean? You know, honestly, what I'm most proud about is how it changed me as a husband and father. Hmm. That, that truly is what, um, so just to give the, the example, you know, I, I said, you know, my wife's advice, you know, and there was a transformation in me at that point in time. And, you know, I, to, for the better, you know, I became a better person because of, of that advice and, and how I decided to change my view on life in general. And at one point in time, this is probably about, I, I don't know, maybe six months in at, at Tiffany's, uh, as we'll call it a lean practitioner. And, you know, she actually came to me and she was like, you know what? I, you know, after that event, you know, eight, nine years ago, she's like, I didn't actually think you could become a better person, hmm. but somehow you have. Hmm. And I truly attribute that to lean. And to my focus on continuous improvement and respect for people. It's the Toyota way. Yeah. Toyota, Toyota way is what changed that. But what I have now is now I have the tools to help me do that. It's like, it's one thing to be like, well, you know, you need to be a better husband and father. But it's another to be like, look, you know, we can use 5S in our home. We can use problem solving. You know, there's all of these other things, you know, just the simple aspect of respect uh, we went from, you know, my wife's kind of mantra, the, the year before I became a lean practitioner is, you know, with the kids were having an issue, you know, she's like, you know, you need to reset, you know, we said reset. I don't know how many times, you know, cause that's, that was our way of dealing with the issue. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm harping on respect and, you know, my wife won't push. She's like, that's our new phrase. You know, instead of, you know, last year was reset. Mm-hmm. Now it's respect, you know? So it's not like, you know, if the kids have an issue, you know, they did something. It's like, look, this isn't a matter of you did something wrong, but you know, it was, it wasn't respectful to, to everybody else or even, you know, possibly to yourself. Yeah. You know, so how can we resolve that? How can we look at this and, and make it better? Mm-hmm. And that's the, 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 the changes that have happened with me personally as an individual, is what I'm most proud of. Wow, at, pretty cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, have you read any good books lately? That doesn't even have to be continuous improvement re- related. Just any any book. So the the book that I've read within this last year that I I couldn't believe I hadn't read before it would be Taichi Ono's Workplace Management. Yeah. It it's I I I read his uh, Toyota Production System. Skinny book, right? Pretty small. It like, is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I mean, it should be a, a relatively quick read. You know who should translated be. it, right? I, My business I partner, John Miller. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. He translated the entire book. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's gone through a couple different iterations or whatever, but John, sure. you know, was raised and born and raised in Japan, you know, with yeah. his parents and, and so he speaks Japanese fluently. So yeah, he, he went through that, then that entire book. So yeah. Yeah, John yeah. Miller. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. But that that to me so far, it, it's so, like I said, it should be a quick read, but I find myself, there's so many oh, yeah. pearls of knowledge within that. that yeah. it, it's almost like, do I highlight, just do I just dump it in yellow paint and say it's all highlighted? Yeah, exactly. Not, the whole book's but, highlighted, yeah. <laughs> it, that, that, within the last year, that's by far the best book I, yeah. I've personally 
Yeah. Well, we'll we're going to definitely link to it in the show notes. People can uh, can check that out. So last, last question. So you've been been around a block a little bit, Josh. You've got a lot of great background and learned at Toyota, but uh, is there a, a knowledge or, or skill area that you feel you need to improve on in order to become a, a better lean thinker? You know what? <laughs> so here I was going on, you know, how I've become a better person, uh, but I still think I have so much farther to go. I, I think, you know, even... I still find myself, uh, even within my quality circle, um, trying to dictate one way, mm. you know, because again, I still have those underlying feelings of, well, you know, I know better and it just trying to get to that point to where I, I truly, I, I guess, listen, mm-hmm. listening is what I need to work on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's listening to everybody's, uh, viewpoint and, and taking it from there yeah. instead of me trying to dictate yeah. what happens. Yeah, It's not easy. I guess I, I always say that's why <laughs> God gave us uh, two ears, yeah. right? And one mouth. Right. <laughs> right. So good stuff. All right. Well, hey, man, it's been great chatting with you. Uh, um, really, really enjoyed it. Normally, these episodes don't go this long, but it's, I can't even imagine. We've been on for Sorry. almost 50 <laughs> minutes, but I, I, I can't even tell. It's been such such a fun conversation. So let's kind of wrap it up with uh, telling people how they can uh, connect with you. Sure. So the, the best way would be LinkedIn. Um, just, I think if you search Joshua D. Sanchez, mm-hmm. D being the middle initial, mm-hmm. um, that's by far the best way to, to connect with me. Got it. Got it. That's by far my preferred social media. Got it. Our, <laughs> all right. Well, again, I, I want to have you back on the show, but we'll, we'll give you six months or so to get Got into it. this healthcare world and, uh, and we'll come back on and, and catch back up with you and see how things are going. Well, that sounds great, Ron. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Josh. Good luck, and uh, you take care. I will do. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Gemba Academy podcast. Now it's time to take a free, no-strings-attached, fully functional test drive of Gemba Academy's School of Lean and Six Sigma over at GembaAcademy.com. Gain immediate access to more than 500 Lean and Six Sigma training videos free of charge at GembaAcademy.com.